You can't really pick up any major magazine or newspaper today without seeing articles about big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And there's a lot of fear factor going on, right? There's a lot of fear that our elections are going to be impacted, that our livelihoods are being threatened, that our economy is under attack. In fact, it really seems like some of these articles are proposing that data is the next gold or the next oil. And in fact, Andrew Ning says that if data is the next oil, then artificial intelligence is the next engine. It really seems like big data is threatening our privacy and artificial intelligence is ready to take our jobs. Today, I'm going to try to reassure you about artificial intelligence, big data, and machine learning, and maybe convince you this is the most amazing time to be an innovator in this space. It's not about fear, it's about the opportunity right now. And it's an amazing opportunity at that. But first, let's make sure everyone is level setted on exactly what do these terms mean, because they're often used interchangeably. The first term is artificial intelligence. And that's maybe the more grander of the terms. Artificial intelligence just means mimicking aspects of human intelligence. It might be driving a car, translating a language. It might be recognizing faces in a photo. One kind of artificial intelligence is machine learning, where we're going to teach that computer to do, to do those skills using data. Now, it might be obvious, of course we're going to use data to teach a computer. What else would you use? But you could also use rules. You could go gather a room full of experts and ask them what the rules are to learn something. But machine learning is about using the data. In fact, there are two kinds of machine learning. They're supervised and unsupervised. Supervised means that we know the right answer. We know who's in this picture. And the computer can get it right or wrong, and we can measure accuracy, sensitivity, specificity. We can come up with a score. How good is the computer? Unsupervised means we really don't know what's going on in this data. Computer, help us find something, find some patterns, some interesting way to organize the data. There is no right or wrong there in unsupervised. And then one kind of machine learning is deep learning. And deep learning means to use uh, different neurons to kind of look like the human brain, trying to mimic the human neural architecture to do the machine learning. It crudely mimics that. At least it did at the beginning now. Now, these are the terms that we use uh, in this field. And it's amazing. They still seem sophisticated, but part of why I'm on stage is to demystify these concepts. Because in the end, these are software tools that you borrow and put into your software as you're writing some code. In fact, you could go to Amazon and buy dummies books on these subjects right now. I just checked, they're about $19 each. Right? Even dummies can learn about this, I guess. Now, if these terms still seem sophisticated to you, let me introduce you to the most basic form of machine learning. Almost all of us are taught in eighth or ninth or 10th grade the concept that we can fit a line to a bunch of points. You typically get this in science class. So here you see a bunch of blue points, and there's an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. It should be intuitive to you that as we add more blue points, that red line starts to fit them better and better. Some of you in pre-algebra might remember y equals mx plus b, right? You got an intercept, you have a slope there. And as we add more points or teach the computer, the line gets better and better. Now, you might look at this and think, how on earth is this machine learning? But think about this for a moment, that I can give the computer that x coordinate on the bottom, and it'll give me its best guess of what the y coordinate should be, right? I give it an x, and it gives me a y. Isn't that amazing? But actually, it's just a simple formula, y equals mx plus b. This is linear regression. Now, this is the simplest possible form of machine learning, but already you can start to see the patterns. You give it more data, the model gets better and better. And something interesting about how we're going to be approaching machine learning in the future. Imagine that the future of computer science is not just going to be about learning Java, or C++, or Python. A future direction for computer science might be becoming a teacher. How do we teach the computer with the right points, the best points, not so much bias, representative data? 
So a large component of computer science in the future is going to be about being a great teacher. Think about that for a moment. Now, all of this seems sophisticated, and all of this is taking off. There's a huge amount of hype here. Why is artificial intelligence taking off so much right now? There's three key reasons. The first is we have incredible hardware now. Hardware from companies down the road like NVIDIA. And NVIDIA makes gamer boards and display boards for gamers that play Fortnite. Maybe you've heard of Fortnite. And it's not just Fortnite, it's any first-person shooter. Boy, you want to get those pixels as fast as possible onto the screen. And it turns out the same hardware that we try to make into better and better video boards, that same hardware is also useful for teaching computers up with machine learning. In fact, people like me now buy these video boards at such a level that it's actually hard for gamers to buy these boards, right? Because they're actually more useful to us. And NVIDIA is one of many companies, but it happens to be one not too far from here that I'm showing. So we got great hardware. We also have great software. Software from companies like Google or universities like Berkeley and Stanford. And it's not just software, it's free software. Anyone in this entire audience can go download this software, every logo you see here, for free. You don't have to pay for the best software that the best companies and universities actually use. How amazing is that? Data science is now democratized, that any of us can actually get the software and just start to use and just start to play. So you got hardware, you got software, and we got a lot of data now to teach these computers with. You know, one of the most amazing tricks with data is instead of going to go gather data, how can you convince people to give you data for free, right? Learn from others as they're doing their job, actually gather their data and then teach the computer. So here are just a couple of representative examples. Amazon, we buy things, I'm sure many of you do too, on Amazon, but in, in the course of buying products, the computer learns, boy, they ordered this and then they ordered that a week later. Right? And maybe someone else might be interested in ordering this other product a week later. Right? You see the recommendations all the time. On the top right is uh, Watson playing in Jeopardy, trained with all the literature and all the articles of the world, right? playing a game show, but still important project. On the bottom left there is Waymo, one of many companies within a 25 mile radius of where we're standing, trying to make a car that drives itself. Right? You just heard another talk about self-driving cars. And a lot of these cars now are learning from the human drivers and then trying to pick that up from what they're actually seeing in terms of behavior. And then Google, of course, learns from the entire world's literature on the web, every web page. No matter how good or bad it is, Google knows how to learn from that. Incredible amounts of data now, but you got great software and great hardware as well. What I'm gonna tell you about is another amazing area where we can use AI and machine learning because we got the hardware, we got the software, and we have incredible amounts of data. And that's in biology and medicine. I'm showing here just what looks like a regular CAT scan of the brain. And whether it's a CAT scan or an MRI or a cardiac study where we're looking at how the heart is beating, boy, we get a lot of images in medicine, a lot of data there. And it might be radiology like this or pathology where we're looking under the microscope, maybe at someone's cancer, maybe to even tell if it's a cancer. So we got a lot of image data in biology and medicine. But it's not just image data. We have all of these medical records. Now, I bet most of the younger folks in this audience have never seen files like this, but some of the older folks in this audience remember when they used to go see a doctor, they would take notes in these kinds of file folders here. Of course, this is how doctor's offices used to be organized. We've moved to electronic medical records, especially because it's really nice and pretty when they look all organized. It's really a mess when you have a patient that's been in the hospital for days or weeks or months. You don't even know where to store all the paper sometimes. This particular floor of the VA hospital where this was taken was under so much pressure from the weight of the paper that the floor was starting to buckle. Of course we're gonna to start to computerize these records. And if you have any idea, if you have any doubt that your doctor is using computers, you might remember the last time you saw your doctor, you might have seen the back of their head because they were typing as they were talking to you. That's an electronic medical record system. Another neat development I want to share with you, actually, is that while we keep all these records and we use them in a safe, responsible way, more of these records are actually going to make it out to you. And many of you might know, many of you might use an iPhone. I'm just giving you one example of how records are going to make it to you. 
Some of you might remember this health app. For the longest time, I never used this app, right? It counted some steps and might look at your sleep patterns if you were that sophisticated with your iPhone. But now, actually, the second tab over, you click on health data, and it actually figures out where you are in all the hospitals around you and makes a guess. Maybe one of these hospitals or clinics is where you get your care. And literally, you can log in with your credentials there, and all of that health data and zoop, goes right into your iPhone. And the future, I, I predict another year or two, we're going to see all a bunch of health apps helping you figure out what to do with all this health data. I couldn't even show any of this a year ago. This is all brand new right now on your iPhone. You probably don't even know this app does this. It's an amazing time for health data. Another grand source of health data is in DNA data. What is DNA? It's the same core elements, the building blocks of all of your cells. You have six billion letters, six billion base pairs, three from your mother, three from your father. Those two come together and make you who you are, right? All the different genes, recipes that your cells need to make. On the left there is how we used to sequence DNA. In 2003, we finished a genome project. That was after 13 years and $3 billion to get that project done. Many countries involved. On the top right now is my hand holding a USB stick sequencer. This literally is powered by USB power, right? Instead of factories like the left, you can actually get an entire genome sequence just with a USB stick. It's a no-brainer this is going to affect medicine. So you got electronic health records, you got all this image data, you got all this DNA data. What an amazing time it is to be a computer scientist in this field of biology and medicine today. And all this data is just sitting there waiting for someone to figure out what to do, what to do with our patients today. Now, it's amazing to get all that data from one patient. It's amazing to get all that data from one hospital. What I'm going to explain to you is something even bigger than that. I'm really lucky that I get to be the chief data scientist now for the entire University of California health system. Now, many of you know what the University of California is, right? We have a lot of graduates here from Harker that go to Berkeley or go to UCLA. Those are the two major universities I think we send folks to, but they go to Santa Cruz. They go to other campuses as well. The University of California has 10 campuses and three national labs. It's incredible. But of those 10 campuses, six of them are medical, that there's a medical school. But we also have pharmacy schools and veterinary schools and nursing schools. But we've got six major medical campuses. And at what, they, what campuses they are. UCLA and UCSF are in the top 10, according to US News, a war report. And we train half of the medical students and residents in the state of California. All those trainees actually come out of the University of California. But we have nearly 100,000 doctors taking care of 15 million patients. 5% of the U.S. population ends up getting some care in the University of California. And all of that data is there for us to learn what's working in medicine, what's missing in medicine, and what might be excessive in medicine. What are things we don't need to do anymore? And I'm just going to walk you through a couple anecdotes, two anecdotes showing you how we're doing this, actually, at University of California, San Francisco. The first is explain a disease called type 2 diabetes. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. Sadly, more and more kids are getting this. And this happens a lot because you either get older or you get obese, and there's an obesity epidemic going on in the United States. And type 2 diabetes is nasty. It's not a great condition to have. It eventually can rob you of your eyesight and your kidney health and your heart. How do we treat type 2 diabetes? Well, this is the graphic that comes out of the American Diabetes Association. And the way to think about this is patients start at the top and they work their way down. At the top, it says, you should eat better and lose weight, maybe exercise. Of course, that's a no-brainer. But if and when that fails, you got a big metformin there at the top. And if and when that fails, you got these uh, six boxes in the middle that you can choose, six categories of drugs. And then when those fail, you can add the other five categories, right? And then when everything fails, you got a metformin and insulin, injected insulin at the bottom there, right? So you can kind of see the path of what you're supposed to take with patients. So I was staring at this diagram. I was noticing those six boxes in the middle there. I was thinking, well, which one would I choose if I were a diabetes doctor? Well, the graphic there says the choice depends on the patient and the disease. In other words, it gives you no clue which box you should choose. But more and more, it's important to actually figure out which box to choose because some of those boxes in the middle cost 200 times more than some of the other boxes in the middle. Yet they're all in the same kind of nice 
square shape, same pastel-y colors. You'd never really have a guess that some of those boxes cost 200 times more. We used to call these diabetes donuts, but then we realized that would be inappropriate for diabetes. <laughs> so now we call these lifesavers, right? And actually, you can read this like a pie chart, and pie would also be inappropriate for diabetes. There's 12,007 patients here with type 2 diabetes in the middle there. And this is the first uh, tr a drug we choose. A third of them you can see are in yellow. If you follow that at the top, it says metformin. Okay, that's great. That was the right answer there, right? And a third of them at the bottom there are on insulin. Wow, there's someone starting them on insulin first. Well, that's interesting. And then you got the gray is sulfonylureas. And all the other colors there are different combinations of drugs. Patients are starting on two or three drugs. Wow, that's a pretty heavy amount of drugs to use on a patient in the beginning. And the black bar means there are so many little slices there, I can't even show you them all. So this is the first move we made. The patient goes, comes back in 90 days. Here's the next move we made. So everyone in yellow that has just the yellow by itself, that means that first dose of metformin we picked was perfect. This patient has never had to change that dose. Yellow to yellow means we are still on the same drug, metformin, but we had to change the dose. And every other color to any other color means we added a drug, subtracted a drug, changed the drug. It didn't work out just right. Patient goes home, comes back in 90 days. Here's the next move. Patient goes home, comes back in the next 90 days, and here's the fourth move. And this is diabetes played out over the first four moves. But then you realize at the top, it says, we have 1,640 different ways to play this game. 1,600 different ways our doctors are taking care of type 2 diabetes. Probably too many. What's the future? Where is this patient going to be in 90 days? What's going to happen to this patient in the next year? And what are we going to do about it? And that, to me, is going to be the new definition of a data-driven medical center, right? One that knows how to use the data to take care of all 15 million of its patients. That's why I'm so thrilled to be at the University of California and so thrilled to tell you this is a modern era of using data in medicine, right? It's not about stethoscopes and bandages. More and more is going to be about data. Learn about AI, learn about computer science, but learn about biology and medicine too. Biology is extremely molecular today, and medicine is very digital. Patients, families, doctors and nurses are all counting on the next generation to come up with all of the solutions we need. We need new drugs, we need new diagnostics, we need better ways to take care of patients. I really, really hope some of you will join us on this journey to create a much better medical system, keeping patients of the world healthy and happy.